Father, God, we want to know you. We want to know your truth. God, this world will tell us so many things on, on what is right to think about, what is, what is uh, uh, proper, but God, you are truth. You know what is right. You know what is. So God, we want to know you. I pray that you speak to us wherever we are in our lives, in our situations. Help us to focus our eyes, our hearts, our ears on you and your word. And Holy Spirit, may you make yourself known to us today. Move in this place and touch every single life here, wherever they're at. And we just ask that you speak to us and that we listen. Let's say pray in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. So Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. If you have it opened or if you've opened your app to it, good. If someone next to you has it, uh, look off of them or read along with me. So I'm reading from the NASB version, just in case you get a little muddled up with your words there. So I'm going to read it and just follow along, listen along. Uh, Verse 35 says this, On that day when evening came, he, Jesus, said to them, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And there, and there arose a fierce gale of wind, and the waves were breaking over the boat, so much that the boat was already filling up. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he got up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Hush, be still. And the wind died down and became perfectly calm. And Jesus said to them, why are you afraid? 
do you still have no faith? They became very much afraid and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So today we're kind of pressed on time. I'm not going to give any uh, very much like personal anecdotes or stories because I just want to get right into it. Um, I've been told if I don't keep it under 25 to 20 minutes, I won't be appreciated today. (laughs) So let's make sure that happens. (laughs) Oh, sorry, I I didn't click the thing. So what is postmodernism? Just a recap. Uh, It is, again, this idea, this movement, that there is no real absolute truth. (laughs) Ravi Ravi Zacharias, (laughs) I can't even say his name, Ravi Zacharias, puts it in this way. The postmodernist says that there is no truth, there is no certainty, and there is no reality. No truth, no certainty, no reality. Who here has watched the movie The Matrix? It's a, it came out like probably more than a decade ago. The Matrix. So in The Matrix, there was this idea that nothing is real. There was a guy eating a steak, and he was saying like, you know what, this looks good and this tastes good, but it's kind of sad knowing that there really is no steak here. It's just like data, information, or, or nothing. And, or there's a kid who has a spoon, and he's found out the ability to bend reality because the realization that there is no spoon, there is no reality. Of course, The Matrix is a fictional story about a post-apocalyptic world where machines have taken over humanity and we're all in this virtual world where really, this isn't reality. But here, now, away from The Matrix, away from fiction, we have reality. But contrary to that, there is this notion, this postmodern notion that there is no truth, no certainty, and no reality. This, of course, all came after the Industrial Revolution. This came after existentialism. This came after all this development in humanity where we're finding out about science and facts and truth and lies. I mean, and laws, lies, oh, sorry, and laws. So all these discoveries are being made scientifically but yet, there's this group of people who are saying, okay, that's, that's great, there's, there's that stuff that you're proving, but what about how I feel? What about my emotions? You know, how can you say that that's not really truth, how I feel about certain things? And so that's what brought about this motion that maybe there really is no actual truth to be had, or no actual certainty and no actual reality which is a really, sounds odd to us, because you ask a question like, what is two plus two? And it's four. You know, that's a pretty objective truth. But yet, there is this notion, and I want to challenge you to think, what are some things that we think are maybe not certain, or not real, or not true? No truth. Going back again to Mark chapter 4, verse 35, Is that what it says? Verse 35. 38. Sorry, I messed up my slides. Go to 35. Oh, no, 38. That's right. Jesus himself was in the stern, asleep on the kitchen, kitchen, cushion. (laughs) I need more coffee, clearly. (laughs) That is a bougie boat if there's a kitchen. Asleep on the cushion, and they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? So these are the disciples in a boat, and there's a storm brewing, and the waves are, are crashing against the boat, and it even says uh, in the verses before that the water started to fill the boat. So, of course, they're fearful. And Jesus, doing his thing, of course, in the middle of a storm, is fast asleep. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but I, I used to, I told the story about how I, I could sleep anywhere through anything. Like, that's one of my, like, superpowers. <laughs> um, I remember being on a flight with a friend, and uh, I woke up after the flight, of course, though we were touching down, and I was like, ah, we're here. And he was just like pale. And he's like, dude, that was the roughest flight. Did you not feel that, tri- like, that, that turbulence? I was like, no. <laughs> I, was, I was gone the moment we sat down. I didn't hear the, the lady do this stuff, you know? I was out. But he said apparently there was some really bad turbulence. And I could hear it through all the other passengers as we were exiting was about this turbulence we had. And I was like, whoa, I slept through that. Pretty cool. Um, Jesus did just the same. During a storm, he fell asleep, 
And his disciples said, teacher, do you not care? Do you not see that there's a storm right now and that we're about to die? So they woke him up. This is so interesting because do they realize who Jesus is in this moment? Do they realize who God is in this moment? And what God is compared to a storm? And so the reason why we say this is no truth because I wonder how many of us very much know the truths of God, but sometimes when things get hairy, when things get stormy, we think, did, did God really say that though? Did God really mean that he was going to take care of me? Did God really say that he was answering my prayers? Genesis 3.1, has God really said? Those are the words from Satan to Eve, talking about the fruit. Did God really say that? You shouldn't eat from the fruit. Did he? Is that what he, really, he meant? Maybe he meant figuratively, don't eat it with your eyes, but maybe you could eat it with your lips. You know? But I want to argue that I think we, as Christians, often fall into this lie, this, did God really say that? Or did God really mean that? Remember, in postmodernism, there is no truth. So if God said it, maybe he didn't truly mean what he said. We see this with many different issues. We see this when it comes to gender. We see this when it comes to laws. Just recently, cannabis has been made legalized in Canada, if you didn't know. <laughs> if you didn't know. You know, that, that used to be such a, there used to be such a black and white about things like that. Things like abortion, things like suicide, things like drugs. It used to be very black and white about how we use these things. But now, in this, what we like to call a postmodern society, everything is becoming very gray. A quick little story about this is um, when I, I used to work for a nonprofit organization. They were a non Christian organization as well. And we worked with kids. One of my trainings was I had to do a suicide prevention course. So it was learning how to deal with people who, were, who had suicidal thoughts and you know, how to walk them through that process. Anyways, in this course, there was about 20 people in the room, and we had a survey. And one of the things on the, on the survey, it said, how do you, do you agree or disagree with some of the, with these statements? And there'd be different statements about suicide. And the first statement being, suicide is wrong. Me, thinking, yeah, that's, that's wrong. Like, we're here to prevent it. I said, I strongly agree that suicide is wrong. Now, when it was time for us to put all of our answers onto the, the public board and kind of see where everyone's at, I found out that I was the only one of a room of 20 that strongly agreed that suicide is wrong. Uh, long, story, long, story short, long, story short, long story short, long story short, I got in a lot of trouble for this. I sparked up a lot of arguments. Uh, I offended people with my belief that suicide is wrong. Because I guess the argument was, how can you tell someone that suicide is wrong? Are you saying that they're right or that they're wrong as people, that they're wrong for making those decisions, that the people who have killed themselves are bad? And I'm like, no, 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 but can we not agree that life is precious and valuable, that we should preserve it at all costs? I mean, like, why is there a suicide prevention course if it's not wrong? And so I was very conflicted. I almost lost my job over this. It was crazy. Um, but that kind of showed me just kind of where we are at in society in terms of a gray area. Sure, God said, don't kill people, don't take lives. But is that really what he meant? You know, what about how I feel as a person? What about if, what if it's my right with my body in this society? You know, and so we have all these questions. And uh, Ravi Zacharias also likes to pin pinpoint that postmodernism isn't a new idea. <laughs> I mean, look at Satan right in the beginning. Did God really say that? There is this notion that there is no real truth. Now, no certainty. Verse 39 says this, and he got up, Jesus got up, and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, hush, be still, and the wind died down, and it became perfectly calm, and he said to them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? This is really interesting because we see that maybe the disciples did understand who Jesus was. 
Maybe they were getting to get to know him on, a, on who he was as God. You know, maybe they were. But here we see a lack of faith where you may know it, but do you truly believe that God can do that? Do we truly believe that God can rescue us from the storm? We sing about it every Sunday. We, we pray about it. We, we thank him for, for what he's done. But sometimes, and I know I'm guilty of it myself, when things do get hairy and scary, I tend to doubt and my, my faith wavers. And I say, but God, like, will you really do that? Will you really calm the storm? Are you really capable of it? We're not certain. Our faith isn't quite there sometimes. But yet Hebrews 11.1 1 says this, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. The conviction of things not seen. That's what it means to have faith, to be, to be certain of something, to be convicted of it, to be assured in it, even though you don't see it. And so, I mean, these disciples were probably told, yeah, Jesus could do that. They probably saw Jesus do all these things. But in the heat of the moment, we doubt. In the heat of the moment, we lose that certainty, that assurance that God can. And this is a very postmodern way of thinking, to, to doubt something that it really is, right? This whole no truth, and now there's no certainty. Now the postmodernist also believes that there is no reality. This is a really strange one, because we... What's tangible to us is what's real, right? A lot of science has a lot of um, tangible evidence to, the, to their findings. Verse 41 says, They became very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? I wonder, do we see God do something and think, Wow, like, how did that happen? I see miracles. I see, I'm, I'm, I'm one to admit that when it comes to healings and things like that, when I hear stories of people being healed, I think, yeah, praise God. But deep down inside, there is a skepticism about it. And I don't know if you're in that same boat where, is that real? Did that really happen? When you read scripture, sometimes things in scripture just sound so out of this world. You read through Exodus and you see how, how God brought plagues of frogs and boils and killed every firstborn. And you see how he brought the, the Israelites through waters, literally splitting the seas. Of course, there's people trying to prove this scientifically. How did this happen? How did Jesus turn water into wine? How did Jesus walk on water? Or do we forget the reality that he did? Because he's God and he can Oftentimes we see something so amazing, we're so quick to be skeptical about it, especially when it has something like God involved, when it's a miracle. And I admit again, I'm very much that person. Like, really? God did that? Like, that's, that's awesome. Praise God. But like, really? And I feel like I'm not alone in that. Those things just seem to be so out of this world to me, so foreign. But yet remember that Jesus was very much a foreign person coming onto this world. He wasn't of this world. He was God. He was so a part of this, uh, uh, set apart from this world. And so, of course, what he did kind of stepped out of the parameters of our reality, of what we knew is possible. Romans 1.20 says this, for, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. God has made the reality of himself known to every single person. We are not, we do not have an excuse to say when we are face to face with God saying, God, but I didn't, no one even, no one told me that you were real. I didn't know you were real. God made it so. He said, my invisible attributes, me, being God, I have already made myself known through creation, through everything that I am. He has made his reality known to us. 
And this is very counter to, to us as, as humans. And this is why we get this postmodern thinking of, is God real? Is this real? Did this happen? We are very human in that sense. But yet God has revealed himself to us already. That he is real and the reality of his existence and what he does. So again, the postmodernist and even us being raised in a postmodern society often think that there is no truth, that there is no certainty, and that there is no reality. But I want to challenge us as Christians, if we want to make this world our missions field, if God is telling us to go and make disciples, we need to know truth. We need to know certainty, and we need to know reality. When we are faced with people who are telling us otherwise, if you were here last Sunday, remember that the postmodernist doesn't like when we are wavering in our own answers. So we need to know the truth that we believe. As Christians, my question is, do you know this gospel that we are preaching? Do you know the truth that it holds? Do you know the truth that Jesus came down as man? Do you know the truth that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Do you know the truth that he resurrected? And the truth that it's not by what we do, but by the grace of God that we're saved. Do you know that truth? It is so hard to argue with someone about truth when we don't even know our own truth. And that even goes to, do you know what God is saying in the rest of his word, not just the four gospels? I think that, needs to, that challenges us to actually get to know God. If you want to know truth, you need to know God. And to know God, we need to know his word. There's really nowhere else. I mean, you come to church, because we're, we're sharing God's word. These aren't new words that I'm sharing. This is still God's word. And outside of Sundays, God wants us to know him so personally. Know him. Before we are going out to this mission of telling people about truth and arguing truth and getting people to know truth, do you first know that truth of the gospel? Do you know truth? We need to. No certainty. When this world is saying that we can't really put our faith into much things, you know, everything is wavering, there's so many different answers to things, even when it comes to faith. Faith itself and religion, there are so many choices out there. We call this age not just a postmodern society, but a post-spiritual society, where people are looking for spiritual experiences, that's why you see very, a lot of new ageism. You see a lot of horoscopes. You see a lot of palm reading. You see a lot of things like yoga. You know, you see a lot of minerals and crystals and, and star reading. And, and all these things seem so normal to society, but yet we don't, people don't want to link themselves to a god or to a religion. But yet we're looking for a spiritual experience. This world has a lot to offer. So, of course, this is a world where there is very little certainty about our faith. Now, the question is, if this is your mission as Christians, do you know certainty? Do you really believe what you believe? To believe means three things. To be convinced of something, to have confidence in something, and to entrust oneself to something. Oh, I didn't have it there. Um, take, for example, the example of a chair. Um, where is a chair? I'm going to grab this chair. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, no, I turned off the screen. Panic. We've all seen the example of a chair when it comes to belief, right? So, again, to believe in something means that you are convinced of it. Are you convinced that this is a chair? Yes. Yes, it is a chair, right? Okay, just got to check. <laughs> Objective truth here. So we're convinced it's a chair. Um, now the next step in believing in something is, am I confident that it will do what it will do? You know, it, it looks pretty sturdy. It has four legs. If I shake it, it looks... I personally may say yes. 
I have confidence in this chair that it'll do what it needs to do, which is hold me up. I'm not very heavy, so it should be able to do it. Now, that's all great and stuff to be convinced of something, to have confidence in it, but the big step in believing is entrusting oneself to it. Now, the big step in believing for me is, will I actually sit in this chair and let it do what I believe it will do? It would suck if this fell. Yes. So, to be certain about something, to be certain about your faith, are you first convinced of it? Are you convinced that Jesus died for your sins? Are you convinced that he rose again to call you his child? Are you convinced that it's not by your doing, but by his doing that you are saved? Are you confident in him as God? Are you confident that he can save you? Confident that he can answer your prayers and do what he said he can do? And then the next step is, will you entrust yourself to God? Will you let yourself fall into the arms of the unknown? Remember, faith is something, is assurance of something that we don't quite see. And God is someone that we often don't see. How can you just fall back into the arms of something and hope it'll catch you? You need a level of faith and of certainty. Now I can tell you this, if you are trying to tell someone who believes there's no certainty in this world, that they can find their certainty in Christ, you better believe that you have to walk that walk. You need to show them through your life that you are fully trusting in God in everything that you do. Because the moment someone sees you falter is the moment, if they're not certain, how can I be certain about God? You know? And sure, yeah, we're human, but this is just a, a wake-up call for all of us is we need to know that certainty of God, of who he is. And it even gives, brings it back to this next level is, are you certain that Jesus has saved you? On a scale of 1 to 10, if you were to die this minute, are you going to heaven? How sure are you that you're going to heaven? On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being 100%, I am going to heaven, I am saved. Or 1 being, no, I don't, I don't even know. I don't think so. Do you fit somewhere in the middle? Are you saying, you know what, maybe today I'm feeling like a 9. I feel like, yeah, I'm pretty saved. Or today, are you more of a, a five? And you're saying, oh, man, you know, I told a few lies the, uh, a few hours ago. Um, or uh, I got really angry at someone. Or I stole something. Or, or whatever it is, you know. Or I looked at something I shouldn't have. So I don't know about today. I don't know if I'll die and I'll be in heaven. You need to be certain about where you're going. You need to be certain about what Jesus did for you. Because when he says that if you believe in him, you will not perish and you will have eternal life, you better believe that is 100% guarantee. That is salvation. And if you're not certain about it, how can you tell someone and tell them to be certain about it? No certainty. And lastly, no reality. This is a really tough thing, especially when it comes to mission, and when it comes to evangelism is, yes, we can know the reality of God. But I want to challenge you and say, but do you know their reality, the person you're talking to? Because that person's reality might be that there is no God for a reason. That person's reality could be there are many gods and many ways. How can you bridge that gap? If you look back in the story of, uh, of what we just read, of Jesus calming the storm, it's so cool what he does here is how he relates it to the reality of the people he's with. Because back in that day, a very common thing was, was pantheons and knowing many gods, right? And especially in Egypt or in Greece or in Rome, there are gods of the ocean, gods of the winds, gods of the mountains, gods of childbirth, gods of, of the sun, everything. There's gods of so many different things. And we see Jesus here doing something so simple looking, saying, hush, hush, be quiet, wind, and calming it down. And yet we see the disciples saying, who then is this guy that even he, that even the winds will listen to him? 
Jesus is challenging their reality, the reality that there are gods in control of every aspect of this world, to the fact that there is God, Jesus in the flesh right there with them, and he just proved to them who he is, that even the wind listens to him. Jesus knows their reality. It is very hard for us to evangelize, to to share the gospel with someone when we're not coming to understand where they're coming from. I think we're we're more better, we're going to be offending people just by saying, you need to do this and this and this and this, when we need to understand where they're at. Maybe they find out, do they believe in a God at all? Do they believe in something? Do they believe in many gods? You know, where are we connecting ourselves to them? Because everyone has a reality, but we want them to know the reality of God. Talk to someone who has been, for example, like a Muslim all their life, or talk to someone who's been a Hindu all their life, or talk to someone who's been an atheist. That's what they know. That's what they were raised with. Who are you to tell them that they're wrong? Who are you to tell them that the reality has, has been a lie this whole time? That is such a hard conversation. We want people to know the reality of God. So we need to live it out ourselves. We need to build those relationships and bridge those gaps between us and them, just as Jesus did. No truth, no certainty, and no reality. In the midst of this society, where everything is gray, where even things that maybe you believed, we thought were so black and white, for example, male, female, where once upon a time those were pretty absolute truths, is now becoming this big gray area. And now when it comes to faith, where faith itself is a big gray area, where we think, you know what, The Bible may say that, but that doesn't really connect to my context. You know, that doesn't really connect to my situation, so I could kind of shrug that off for now. We need to know the truth of the Bible. We need to know the certainty of our salvation and know the reality of God. If we can know that personally, then our mission to share that with others becomes so much clearer and so much easier knowing God is right there with us and doing, and it's, we're part of his mission. Uh, I was going to close with the story, but I want to, I think I made the time limit. Hooray. <laughs> um, so yeah, that is, I have nothing else to say about that. No truth, no certainty, and no reality in the society where they say there's none of that. Let me pray for everyone. Dear Heavenly Father, God, this is such a weird world we're living in now, where even things that we thought were so right or wrong are becoming unknown or acceptable. God, I pray that in our own personal lives, may we know your truth. May we know the certainty of what you did for us, and may we know the reality of who you are in our lives that we can go out to this world and not be part of it in the sense of we, are of we are of this world, but we are just in it ambassadors of you. God, I pray for every single person here that we can be ambassadors of you. That when people see us, they don't see us, they see you. That when people hear our words, they'll get to know that these aren't just opinions or something subjective but they are coming from truth. They're coming from you, and you are truth. God, we want to glorify you with everything we say, so please help us in our daily mission of sharing you and your gospel, and help us to get to know you so much more personally, Lord. We want to glorify you. This I pray in your great name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Good afternoon. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him, all the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, 
Yeah.